from the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. Today is Friday, the 23rd of September, 2011. My name is Joe Monday of the Southern Oral History Program at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I am in Amherst, Massachusetts, on the campus of the University of Massachusetts in New Africa House with John Bishop, our project videographer, to do an oral history for the Civil Rights History Project, which is a joint undertaking of the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture and the Library of Congress. And we are privileged today to be with Dr. William Lamar Strickland, um, who has taught here uh, in, in many, for many years and long before that, uh, deep engagement in the movement and a whole host of capacities that we'll discuss today. Um, Dr. Strickland, it's a pleasure. Bill, Bill, Bill. Bill, Bill <laughs> it's a privilege and a pleasure to sit down with Thank you. Thanks very mm -hmm. much. Um, just a quick note before we dive into the interview, our videographer John Bishop was long personal acquaintance with, um, with Worth Long, and uh, before we turned on, we were chatting a little bit about um, a mention of Worth, and I thought maybe we'd just ask you to lay that down here so we don't miss it. Okay, well, it's, it's, I, I assume people know Worth was regarded as the poet of SNCC, and for some strange reason there's a quote that's been attributed to Stokely which actually was, was Worth's quote. And it was, quote, false-faced America, we have found you out, unquote. That sounds like Worth. <laughs> <laughs> Bill, let me, um, let me have you begin today with just recalling your, your family and your parents and how you, um, just coming up in Roxbury, and how you found your way um, kind of out of that context, say, to Boston Latin. Wow. Well, it, it was um, elementary school. The, uh, I had a teacher who thought I should apply to Latin school. And Latin school had a, a, a procedure where they would let you in based on your grades. And then as you sat in the auditorium, they would tell you, look to your left and look to your right because he, because at the time Latin school was all boys, of course, 1635, uh, they're not going to be here at the end. So you enter in class six, which is the seventh grade, because we had six years of Latin, and that was, and that was correct. About mo almost 700 guys started out, and we graduated ab about 220, 230, of whom six of us were black. If you would, uh, some recollections of your parents. Oh, my father was killed um, in the war, and the, my mother was uh, worked for Raytheon. She worked the union for Raytheons, but I had this. I had aunts in in Roxbury and fabulous aunts in in uh, in Newark, New Jersey, and <coughs> my mother's family was from Georgia. So I was, as a child, I would go to visit them and in Georgia. And in fact, it, it uh, a little town, a little town out, outside of Macon called, called, Haddock, called Haddock, Haddock, Georgia. The, um, I, later, I later found out, uh, I guess it was my great grandmother was a, the offspring of, of a plantation owner. And the uh, because the town between Macon and Haddock was a town called Gray, and this plantation owner was evident, evidently a, a major figure in Georgia during the Confederacy, Madison Gray. And my uncle, my uncle was, was named after him, Gray. The, but evidently, this was a fairly, um, I guess, open-minded, because um, he left part of the of his land to my mother's family the, so that was the land that they had when I went when I went as a child to visit them yeah. in Georgia <laughs> which branch of service marine corps your father was marine corps oh no he was uh, army yeah. i was in the marine corps yeah. Yeah. Mm. he was 
Killed where? Oh, God. I think in the Italian, in the Italian campaign. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, you've, you've written in, in certain places about um, kind of part of the, the family and community world you grew up in in Roxbury and included obviously um, uh, through I think um, a cousin of yours and early acquaintance with, with uh, Malcolm Little yeah. yes I just recently wrote about that I tried to to uh, we we capitulate that because there's been a, a recent biography of, of Malcolm X, which to which I take great exception, and I wanted to establish that my recollections came from personal experience and not from secondhand experience, because I met Malcolm when I was very young, because he was a, a very good friend of my cousin, whom I say in the article was my hero, because I would be at my aunt and uncle's house and. Girls would call him from New York, and I thought that was the coolest thing. In the <laughs> was the coolest, coolest thing. So I wanted to grow up and be exactly like him. The, uh, uh, but they also were part of a, a group, which I, on, on later reflection, I think may have been, may have been significantly West Indian, because uh, my cousin was at, his father was Bar was Bar was Barbadian. The um, uncle Jake they, was, was his name, Jake Edmund. And, they, and my relatives claimed that at some point in my youth, I said that, that uh, Uncle Jake, I called Uncle Jake the man too mean to die. <laughs> but, he was, but he was cool. And, um, and he was also a numbers banker. The, and so I grew up with numbers sheets and all around my aunt and uncle's house. But Leslie got out of the war, and he came, he got into a, I don't know what the cause of it was, he got into a hassle um, down at the, on Tremont Street. In fact, I, I, I really think it's the same pool room where, where Malcolm met, met Shorty Jarvis. And so he came home and, <coughs> and got his pistol and went back and whacked one or more of the people. But because my uncle was in touch with the Irish Mafia, he got Leslie the best criminal defense attorney. So Leslie only got a year and a day eventually. So he was in Charlestown at the same time as Malcolm. Mm -hmm. So when I met Malcolm later, when Malcolm came to speak at Harvard, I, I went, talked, went up after his, after his talk mentioned Roxbury and, and Leslie, and then we were tight until he died. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me ask a little bit more about um, uh, your, your personal um, history in, in those years. Um, obviously, it was something of a unusual, quite unusual thing still for an African-American young man to be up through Boston and, uh, and into Harvard. I'm interested kind of in your recollections of that moving through those experiences? Well, there may or may not have been a quota, but there were only 11 of us out of 1,000 guys at Harvard. And because of that number, you knew all the black guys who had gone to Harvard 10 years before you or 20 years before you and 20 years after you. So it was uh, an inform, And then they would, you know, they, they had, was a little socialization process when you arrived. They would say, well, most of the people whom you will encounter here will, will, will believe that you're only here for one of two reasons, that you were some maid's son or that you were a genius, and your responsibility is to demonstrate point B. So there was a, a nurturing um, group presence in, 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 Cambridge, in Cambridge for us. And, and I remember uh, Harvard I have very fond memories of, of Harvard. Harvard taught, you know, like, like Du Bois, you know, Du Bois started writing for newspapers when he was in uh, a high school student in Great Barrington. And he, when he got to Harvard, he, he flunked. 
I think it was English one was introduct because they used to have a, a compulsory freshman writing class for everyone. The uh, and I had been similarly favored and I skipped kindergarten and they wanted me to skip uh, first grade and then I'd done well at Latin school. And the so when I got into the writing class. I was a little florid in my, with my language, and uh, we had an English teacher, even Mr. Russo, who said to us, and now, young men, I am going to teach you the secret of good writing. The secret of good writing is rewriting. <laughs> and so I was able to carry that on, car to carry that to heart, to, uh, on to Harvard, but it was, I have very pleasant memories of Cambridge, actually, yeah. Uh, Except when they asked me to put, leave, leave them all my money, and leave them all my money in my will. <laughs> 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 Little money that I have here. Yeah. Let me, let me um, I, I had meant to ask earlier, I just want to make sure I'm, I bet it's here, yeah, your birthday is the 4th of January, 1937. Um, so you entered, you finished at Boston Latin in? 54. 54. Oh, so basically with Brown. Coincidentally with Brown. Yeah, I wasn't thinking about Brown at the time. No. Yeah. Actually, that's not quite true because I was, let me think about that, because I was involved with the NAACP Youth Council when I was oh. in high school. And they had um, a slogan, you know, free by 63, oh. you know, the, the, the centennial of the Emancipation Proclamation. So the, uh, I had forgotten, Jesus, I had forgotten that I was involved with the NAACP Youth Council. Yeah. Well, on that point, you kind of anticipated my, what was going to be my next question, which is, were you a, did you come from a race family, and were you a young, were you an adolescent with much of that question in your mind? No, not particularly. It's, um... There were yeah, episodes. I didn't think about them at the time. They, they crystal, the significance of them crystallized later. They were going to visit my, you know, well, as I said, my, my, my uncle Gray, who was another role model of mine, he had to leave Georgia because he, he, uh, he had a girlfriend who I also remember as being you know, quite, quite striking and some white guy was pursuing her. And I don't know whether he killed him, but they had a confrontation. He at least beat the hell out of him. And then he had to leave. He went to Detroit to live with his older brother, my uncle, in, 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 in Detroit. But, I, but later on, I mean, when I got to Harvard, as I mentioned in, in, the, in the Malcolm article, and was in this graduate, it let me into this graduate seminar with C. Eric Lincoln, and uh, and, Whit and Whitney Young, when I had, I started going to, uh, as I said in the article, race was all around me. And I started, and, and run into Malcolm again. And I started going to the, what was then Temple Number 11, which, which Farrakhan, who was then known as, as Louis X, and listening, as I also say in, in my notes to you, that I was very attracted to the to Malcolm's worldview, but I um, and so I started thinking about going to Georgia, and you come out of you come out of the train station and and etched in stone, and, and the building is you know, colored in white, um, and also I had. I had been in I had been in, in the Corps as well, and I remember. And this is all, you said you interviewed uh, the sh the Sherrods. The I remember being called in to they asked <laughs> for my next duty station, and they asked me how would I like to go to Albany. And the only Albany I knew was Albany, New York. So I said, oh, I, I thought to myself, oh, that's super. I can swoop down to Harlem at, at, at Ketra, at, 
et cetera. And then I went down to, to Howard because there was one of our rival fraternities, the Kappas had a, a big social event called the Kappa Dawn Dance. So, and I had almost gone to Howard um, because I had been offered a super scholarship and they had brought me down to Howard. And I walked across campus and saw a million girls who looked like Halle Berry. <laughs> and uh, I had a, fr a, a, a neighborhood friend, Carl McCall, who was treasurer, or lieutenant governor of New York some, at some point. And he had gone to Dartmouth and he was there with, with a, uh, a guy whose name will come to me perhaps, who was a little older, whose mother was the principal of the famous I think she was, the, uh, or, had, or he had gone as an undergraduate to Dunbar High School, the famous black school in, in Washington. And, he, and this guy was a basketball player, and he had, he had left Dartmouth, gone to Howard, and then, re, and then returned to, uh, to Dartmouth. So I was talking to my mother and friends about going to Howard and then, and then going up to Cambridge. And they said, in effect, a uh, schmuck <laughs> take you behind to Cambridge. <laughs> so uh, the, um, the cause back in those days, you were, there was a community. So it wasn't just you and your family. Your church knew, you know, about your exploits and uh, your, ch and your, and your accomplishments. So you had, in essence, you had the responsibility of the race, because we were told that we had to be twice as good as white people, as you know, white competitors. So you had that that responsibility. But I must say that if you if you grow up in, in well, if you if you if you remember the the, the famous movie Ten, or if you grow up in a in a community where. You, you believe that the, the women you encounter are all eight, nines, and tens, then you go to Howard and see that they're really only fours and fives. <laughs> you know, the socially, you said, whoop, have mercy, Jesus. <laughs> the, so what they said, no, you go on, you go on to Harvard, and, and Howard, Howard can wait, and so you did wait. Mm -hmm. But then, to finish the other story, it's just that when I looked at my, at, while I was at Howard and looked at my orders, I saw that it wasn't Albany. New York, but Albany, Georgia, or, or as the natives pronounce it, Albany. Mm -hmm. the, and that was another, the Marine Corps was a very important mm -hmm. formative experience because most of the people, the military, I assume, still is fu fundamentally a Southern institution. And the people that you had in the Corps were, especially the officers at all, were, um, were Southerners. And the enlisted men were Southerners and or young guys whom the judge had told, we well, have two choices, the Joint <laughs> or the Marine Corps. So, but it was, but I learned about uh, dimensions of white America that I never would have learned otherwise had I not been in the Corps. When were you, when were you in the Marine Corps? 56, 59. 56, 59. What, what were some of those, what, what would be examples of some of those things that you learned? Well, the Marine Corps had, has a, a culture and that you, they instill in you a, I don't know what they're doing now because now all the uniforms look alike. And, uh, <coughs> and uh, the whole period of, 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 of training is not the same as it used to be, but they, if you make a distinction between who you are or were as a civilian and then as a, a jarhead, there are things that you do when you're a civilian that are civilized. If it's raining or snowing, you, you go inside. The, um, and what they teach you is when you think that you cannot take another step, you can run five more miles. So you be you become acquainted with reserves 
personal reserves that you would never otherwise have known. And that creates a certain um, image, identity, which also can work against you because people didn't think they're, you know, they're uh, invulnerable. Um, but it do does, I mean, they, you develop a kind of superiority a attitude towards civilians and to the Army and the Navy, the Swabies, because the Army shoots from the 300-yard line, we shoot from the 500-yard line. Uh, so they instilled, they, for some of these guys, um, the core was their mother and their daddy. I mean, I don't know, and I knew some of their personal stories, but for, for some of these guys, the Marine Corps was everything for them. And that, and trying to understand um, where those needs c came from was educational for me. And then also you become more, you become more humble, because I remember being in boot camp in, the, uh, in Paris Island, mm -hmm. and then at Camp Le and then later on in Lejeune, that um, I'm walking across the base and find myself humming the Everly Brothers. <laughs> that you get indoctrinated in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an atmosphere, because I had you know, been going to Storyville and the stables and, and, was, deep in, and was deep into, ja into jazz. Um, and R and R and R and B, but when you're enveloped in an environment, it's it's interesting how it can have, it can creep into your consciousness. I'm walking around the base humming, <laughs> bye 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 love, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I'm still in touch. One of my old buddies, although we weren't we weren't in the same outfit, just came up to visit me from. Well, there was a big event in, in D.C. for the Buffalo Soldiers. He's living in Savannah, where they just murdered, uh, outside with Jackson, where they just murdered Troy, Troy Anthony Davis. And he rode his bike up. He was also, uh, uh, he came up, he wants to sell his house in Boston, and then he, and then he rode up, up here to Amherst to, to, you know, to visit me. So there is this, there is a fraternity that stays with you forever, actually. Mm. Um, so coming out of the Marine Corps, you went into. You went back to Harvard. I went back to Harvard. Yeah. yeah. Had mm -hmm. you, and you already enrolled there briefly. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So um, I'm interested too. Moving through the last half of the of the fifties, things like um, things like you know, huge things like um, Brown and Montgomery and Emmett Till and Little Rock and all. Kind of your. I'm just wondering about how you're watching those things unfold and thinking about them at the time, as, you, as best you can conjure and recall. I wasn't thinking much about them. The thing that I, that I think struck the consciousness of everyone, and, and subsequently was the reason I later discovered why many people of my generation joined SNCC, was the murder of Emmett Till, because Jet had his picture displayed. Um, and then at, at Harvard, I took an English course with a, a very famous literate, professor of literature at the time, Howard Mumford Jones, and he had us reading Richard Wright, Uncle Tom's Children. Uncle Tom's children will blow your mind. And people still, I talk to my friends, colleagues in, in literature about the significance of that book. Because to me, I mean, I teach it in my, when I teach um, civil rights on my Malcolm and Martin course, I start the, the students off with Uncle Tom's children. I want them to understand just how capricious racism, Southern racism was, uh, and how the least little thing could suddenly become a matter of life and death. Um, so I read Uncle Tom's Children, and that helped. And then Jimmy Baldwin 
in Notes of a Native Son, he has an essay in which, he, in essence, he says, has there ever been a Negro who at some point is not consumed with rage and wants to? And I said, oh, I'm not the only one. <laughs> so, and then it's, I was at Harvard, and then that's when I you know, um, joined NSM. NSM was, as I mentioned, was started by um, a young white student undergraduate at, at, at Yale, Peter Countryman, and it had city projects all around the country in Chicago and Detroit and Boston, Hartford, New York. Um, and they had, was somehow connected to NAG, because that's how I first met Stokely. The, um, I've left out Chicago, Detroit, Hartford, and Hartford as well. And then when Peter decided to go back to school, they asked me to, they asked me to, to become executive director, and I agreed to do that. So that took me, you know, go, going to visit the, you know, the city projects around the country, um, created opportunities so I could meet people like Jim and J James and, and, Gr and Grace Boggs. It, um, yeah, I, mean, I have a range of questions about all that, but can I just, can I just wind back just a bit and ask you one more thing? Um, I'm just interested. Um, is there anything more to say about um, your mother and her influence? Her, her influence was was um, incalculable. I mean, she, in effect, devoted her life to me, um, and that's another reason I tried to do to do well to honor her her commitment. It don't make me cry. <laughs> Happens lots in these interviews. Yeah. Okay. yeah, but she was a great, great person. Yeah. I had great relatives. My aunts, uncles, I had great relatives, and that's what I, you see, missing with this this generation. There's no, there's no community. I mean, you, you kind of belong to the community, and and where I lived on Walnut Avenue, the it was still, you know. Jewish, Irish, um, Armenians, the, the, um, in, in the, no, and I went to Henry Lee Higginson school, that's it was from the Higginson that I went to, to Latin school. So you had all of these different nationalities in your, in your class, in your classroom, but the black community in, in your neighborhood, um, mo mostly you all went to the same church. But you were, you were, a ch you belonged to everybody, and you recognized. But for example, when a few years ago, Grace Boggs was telling me about Detroit, and she was saying, "Billy, we can't go out and organize the way we used to, because you got these gangbangers. You, you know, you're taking your life in your hands just walking out in the street." Um, so the, the changes. I'm not, The changes are, I mean, truthfully, uh, the race is in limbo as it has never been before. And um, there's a confusion. The young, younger generation is, <coughs> is ahistorical. It's not, not their fault, but you don't have what we had. They don't. Okay. Yeah, okay. I mean, we don't have black newspapers. We don't have black radio stations. Five corporations control the media. The, so that there is a difference. I don't bl blame the young people because you didn't, pre in our previous history, you didn't have to teach people what it meant to be black. Um, there was continuity, but now we are, because most of black, most of our history, we have been a southern people. But now we are two and three generations removed from the south. And now you have all this confusion about gender or identity and sexual orientation identity, where women, black women, <laughs> identify as female, gender 
before they do, and gays who identify as gay before, before black. And now you have the census with all these different definitions. Are you Hispanic, white, Hispanic? And now we have new, quote, black people here. You have black people from Africa and from the West Indies uh, who don't have America's history behind them. So, you know, I remember, you know, being in Harlem, being passed by black cab drivers, well, phenotypically black, or you, or getting off the, uh, or flying to D.C., and you have African or Indian, Bengals that may or may not pick you up because they want to take white people to Virginia, to the suburbs. Uh, uh, so there's a great confusion about race in America today, the, um, which of course the evil people take advantage of, divide. What, what they used to divide you by color, now they divide you by gender and whatever. Hmm. Which was the church in Roxbury? Your church? My church, Charles Street AME. Charles Street AME. Mm -hmm. Reverend Walter Cornelius Davis. <laughs> Um, did you did you move into your early adulthood still feeling a close tie to the church? Either spiritual or social? Or? Not particularly. Except in the service, you uh, you become religious when you're being shot at. <laughs> no, I've never been. Um, I mean, I enjoy the church experience, but I, th I, I, I approached it. I actually, I mean, a good, a good black preacher will just, you know, uh, when he starts rapping, or she, because now I've heard some very good female preachers, it's a whole different uh, milieu. It's a whole different, you know, experience. The, um, a, a good preacher will, you know, will, I will re respond independent of whether I believe in, in, in the theology, but I'll certainly, I'll certainly respond to a good preacher. Mm -hmm. Tell me about, you mentioned to the, um, that one of the things that you felt in those years, I'm thinking now, late 60s, you're moving back into Harvard, and that uh, you felt, and uh, quite understandably, felt a great deal of rage. And, um, was, was NSM your principal sort of institutional mechanism for acting on that? Or? Yeah, I think I, I think I, I, I think I did keep in touch with the NAACP, but I was in, in Cambridge, so going back to Boston was, wasn't like be, being in Boston in, in high school. I think NSM, because um, you saw the situation of, of black people all in different regions of the country, and um, so that was educational. And while I was our, our office was in, was adjacent to Harlem, not quite in Harlem. Oh, this is on the, down the, yeah. the um, and I worked with uh, another great guy whose story needs to be told, Jesse Gray, the Harlem Rent Strike leader. And that was another question. He said, and that introduced me to the whole question of um, the history of Black communists. How, you know, and I and the uh, how they had been how they when they insisted that that race trump class how that was a a, a non-starter for the for the party and Jesse had been with another Josh had been in the Merchant Marines so I got I got that history of struggle from you know black of of, of black of black leftists. And, and then I, Jesse taught me something about organizing because um, he had an office like in East Harlem, like East 114th, East 115th. And then when people wanted to, sh got fed up with being exploited by the landlords, he, and, they, and he was, they had a, 
was known, even if written up in the papers, they would call the office, and then we would go over to their to their to their apartments, and he would give them, you know, ta tell them what they had to do that you had to keep collecting the rent money and put it in the bank or somewhere so that when the strike was over, when they came to kick you out, you could have paid paid the back rent. Uh, but it was a very important lesson about how to organize, that the secret of organizing is, in, is convincing people to organize themselves, although they may not realize that it's what's happening at the time. Um, they're ready, and then you give them what needs to be done so that they organize, they organize actually they organize themselves. So that was a very uh, important lesson. And Jesse was a, Jesse was a great spirit. Um, how old was he at that time, Oh, God. I guess he must have. Well, everybody seemed old back when you... <laughs> I guess he was probably... Because he died young. I guess he was somewhere between 40 and 50. And you were mid-20s, 26, 27. Yeah. Yeah. Would he have Let been... Let me see. If he was in Merchant Marines and then World War Two and then... 68, eight years, 25. Yeah, he's probably mid-40s, probably mid-40s, yeah. Well, I wanted to ask, um, and this is maybe maybe the connection, I wanted to ask, one of the very interesting things about NSM, is, as you've noted in things you've written, is that um, after the some early efforts, say, on tutoring black youths in communities, there was a more of a structural shift in the thinking and the critique and, and organizing became, community organizing became a big focus, obviously. And as under your, as you, in, in the tenure, your tenure as executive director and predates, I think it's important to know SNCC's later community work in some ways. Is that your sense? No. Oh, well, no. no uh, um, because SNCC influenced us. Okay. Um, I don't, it would be difficult to, to draw the, the line of demarcation. People may have been doing community organizing even under even under Peter, but it became after you know, everybody began to understand the problem was much greater than tutoring kids. Um, SNCC was a major influence on on our on our thinking, and then we had you know in Detroit. Um, we had, you know, the, the uh, you had, the, you know, the union folk, and you had the guys from Detroit who were who were organizing, um, and although they weren't in NSM per se, we were in touch with them, and so they were they were a role model. And there was a great guy who's who's history needs to be told, named Kenny, Kenny Cockrell. And Kenny was one of the organizers with a guy named General Baker of the black youth in Detroit. And he became a lawyer and he was the only person I have met who almost could rap like Malcolm. He was a fantastic rapper. He became a lawyer, and he, he, he had a, a few wonderful cases. He had a case with this black policewoman who got into some altercation with a, a white officer in the police station garage, and he got her off. And then there was another, another case of a black worker on the line who also had another altercation. He may even have killed the co-worker, and Kenny got him off as well. The, um, and then he ran for office. He was elected to the Detroit City Council and decided that that was um, duplicitous to try and convince people that that city council could make the changes that, was, that, that, that were necessary, so he, he, he resigned from the city council. And then, unfortunately, he had a heart attack, mm. or, and he died in his early 50s. Mm. Mm. But he was a, as we used to say, he was a bad motorcycle. <laughs> <laughs>
In uh, after you make the shift to, to New York in '63 and cross '64, you're obviously, as you mentioned, traveling to see NSN work and the cities where it's involved, and uh, you'll go to Mississippi as well in '64. But I want to ask about how this relocation to, to New York brought you back into contact with Malcolm and how that how the arguments you were hearing him present how you took them up and considered them in relationship to what you were observing and through NSM, through SNCC, through... Well, as I mentioned in, in, that, in that critique, you know, um, I'm in high school and we're, we're, we're watching Martin, and Martin is saying things like, if any blood is to be spilled, let it be ours. And we're saying, oh, no, no. We, just, we said something a lot stronger than that, actually. <laughs> but we, we, that, that was not an argument that persuaded No, you. no, we were, not, we, were, we were not persuaded by, by that. But when I got to, um, into New York, as I also say in the article, Malcolm was everywhere. He was always having these ra rallies on 125th Street. So was Michelle. There were these guys, uh, Eddie Porkchop Davis. They, they brought their ladders or whatever, and they would be rapping um, in front of the Hotel Teresa. And, and Malcolm would, you know, would be walking. And then I would go down to the, to the, the restaurant, I don't know. Um, and as I said, also, I had, I had brought him, after we had reconnected at Harvard, I brought him up to, up to Harvard a couple, a couple of times a week. As I also mentioned, I, mean, I, I, I don't know why, I assume because he knew Leslie, but he'd be, he did. He even visited me at my house uh, when I, before I left Boston, but he never tried to convert me. He never tried to convert me, because I wasn't about to give up spare ribs and, and chasing young girls. <laughs> <laughs> so I, could, I couldn't join the nation. Oh no. <laughs> tell, me about, um, tell me about how you began to um, think your way through the political critique um, that. Malcolm was advancing. Well, people don't appreciate, as I also wrote there, Monica, Malcolm, as I wrote in the piece, in the same way that Marx is the fundamental critic of capitalism and Fanon is the fundamental critic of colonialism, in, to my mind, Malcolm is the fundamental critic of American racism. The, uh, and he would, be, he would be critiquing. And what people also don't appreciate as Malcolm was as hard on, on black people as he was on white people. He would talk about, you know, you don't want to, you talk about you're outnumbered. If the man sends you to Korea to fight 900 million Chinese, you don't say you're outnumbered, you don't say you're, out, you're outnumbered there. He, he got you thinking about um, how you'd been brainwashed. The, um, and then he would say, when he was critiquing Martin, he would talk about the sit-ins, and he would say, well, who sits? You know, cripples sit, old lady, he didn't say cripples, that's it. But he, disabled people sit, the uh, old women sit, babies sit. We don't need to sit, we need to stand up. So he, you know, he, he, had, he, was, um, he had a way, as I said, also said in a Village Voice piece, you, if you want to know what was going on in, in, in world events, um, or, or national events, all you did was walk on down to 125th Street and turn, tune in on the X, because he was a prodigious reader. Um, I think I did, I may or may not have mentioned it in, in, my, in Make It Plain, but I caught him once reading William Buckley's Saturday Review, and I national asked, Review. Na, National Review, yeah, that's right, Saturday, Saturday Review was Andrea Cousins, Norman Cousins, and Andrea Cousins worked for NSM. In fact, she lives, she works right down, she's a, a, a lay therapist down in Northampton. Um, but I asked him why was he reading National Review? And he said, because you never can tell what, where you come across a good idea. He, and he had a prodigious work habits and read every, several papers a day, magazines, and always reading. Um, And his, I, I mean, to answer your question, I was agreed with his critique of the, you know, of the movement and 
and the duplicity of the government. The, I mean, he, we have him in, in, in eyes on the prize because the first rebellion in this country is in Birmingham in May of 63 when there's an attempt to, to whack Martin. They blow up, the, they bombed the A.G. Gaston Motel where he was staying. They also bombed A.D. King, his brother's house. And it was then that the, the masses, the black masses of Birmingham erupted. And Malcolm makes this point that when Bull Connor was using fire hoses and, and, and whatever, Kennedy said he couldn't intervene. But as soon as the black people erupted, he, they nationalized the guard. Or, yeah. And Malcolm, we have this famous scene, well, it's famous to me, in, in, in uh, the Eyes episode, The Time Has Come, where Malcolm says, and there was no new law. See? Um, so, you know, and then that's the snicker. You, know, you have the march on Washington, but Medgar Evers had just been assassinated, and SNCC workers in Georgia had been arrested. Um, Capital truck, sedition. Mm -hmm. For picketing outside the the business, if I recall, of of a, of a juror. Yeah. And they invoked some 19th century law to, to arrest the Snickers. And the FBI just sat, stands around and, and takes notes but does nothing. And then in 64, after Schwerner, Cheney, and Goodman are killed, Hoover says that they're not, you know, that, they can't, that they can't protect civil rights workers. They could, they could co intel pro us, but they couldn't protect us. And that's where worth worth statement comes from down the a little later down the road. I mean black power doesn't drop from the sky. I mean, Stokely was jailed a zillion damn times. People get tired, as Mrs. Hamer says, people get tired of being sick and tired and relying on a a government that does nothing for you and collabor and collaborates with the with the Southern racists whom you are, conf whom you are confronting. Yeah. We're back on. Let me ask you, uh, Bill, to talk a little bit, let's, let's spend a little bit of time talking. You, you, you teach it, obviously, and have taught it in depth and thought so much about this. Let's talk a little bit more about um, uh, Malcolm's critique of, of racism and its role and function in his society. Well, one of the things Malcolm used to, s used to say is that history was the most rewarding of all subjects to study. And I remember being in, in the mosque and he was quoting from a book, a book called Anti-Slavery by D Dwight Lowell Dumont, which is of course now out, out of print. And Malcolm was talking about the slave power. Um, see, the history, is all about how do you how do you contextualize it? What would you think? <laughs> well, suppose you were ET coming down from space, and you're trying to understand. You read about about the glories of of, of America, and, and then s someone was asking about the greatest presidents, and invariably in in that lineup is Abraham Lincoln. So then E.T. asks you, well, wh what president was he? And you say, if you've done your homework, he was the 16th president. Now, what is your image of America if you are taught that of the f 15 presidents before Abe, 10 were slave owners? How does that square with the image of democracy? Or again, in relationship to the government's treaties with the Indians. And once, well, we understand that they broke the treaties. But how many treaties did they break? They broke all 400. So where is the morality in which, in which the, the society garbs itself? Where is it? 
the, um, and that's what Malcolm would do. Malcolm would just throw the hist throw throw the history at you and make you re, re, re rethink what you had what you had been taught. Um, when, on one level, I mean, all societies like to think well of themselves. That's not unusual. That's not unusual in itself. In fact, it's it's de, it's, it's de rigueur. But America is very pompous about it, um, and we, we, and we've just seen it with with Troy Anthony Davis. The whole world, the whole world, embassies all around the world, were be, there were protests. Um, and I asked my students to try to get them to understand how they're being brainwashed. I said, "Did you watch the Arab Spring?" And they said. You watch what's happening in Tunisia? Yes. You watch what's happening in Egypt? Yes. So let me ask you something. It's not that we've established the fact that the American media can bring you on-site coverage from the Middle East. When's the last time you saw on-site coverage from Iraq or Afghanistan? And the answer is, or from the West Bank or Gaza or Tel Aviv. The answer is never. Never. Um, so you're being, <laughs> and it's, I asked, I asked them also if they have a language to read foreign newspapers, just to see how the, what stories are covered and how they're covered abroad, and what stories are covered or not covered, uh, and how they're covered here, here in America. Because um, Americans are the most deceived, uh, uh, except you know, for the people who want to be deceived. The, um, but it's... It's easier to maintain control over people if you take away their critical thinking. Um, and unfortunately, that seems to be, mental retardation seems to be sweeping the country. <clears throat> and I, was, I just wrote a, a quick piece of my friends were calling me about, after they had been following these Republican debates, and they called and said, well, what, what is happening in America? How can, how can these people be potential presidents of your, of your country? The, um, the outside world doesn't understand what's going on, but America has lost, <coughs> has lost its credibility in the world. Well, it had lost it before under Bush. There was no place in the world <coughs> Bush could go where there were not protests against him, <coughs> also not covered by the media. When he went during his first term, when he went, when he went to London, he couldn't ride in a, he had to take a helicopter to Windsor Palace. And the Lord Mayor, there were 15,000 security. Uh, and it cost every citizen of London two pounds to pay for his security. And the Lord Mayor said that Bush was the most unwelcome visitor since William of Orange. And they would have preferred to, sp to give five pounds and have him not come than spend two pounds uh, for his security when he did come. But none of this, none of this is, unpleasantness is shared with the American people. So we, we live in a, a media cocoon, um, which is, is in, in proving increasingly disastrous. I'm sure we'll come back to, to the media question when we talk about um, the effort to develop um, Black Studies curriculum. Um, but let me ask you, Holding that point for now, let me ask you about um, about uh, your experience trying to help with an effort fundamentally to restructure the politics of Mississippi and through that effort, national politics of race around the MFDP, because you would go down to Mississippi in '64. Mm -hmm. Well, this, this is. You know, the government was trying to, to um, derail the student protests. And there were two, and there were two opinions. In, a lot of people were committed to sit-ins and, and protests. The, uh, but the government talked about the power of the vote. And the, um, so Bob goes down to Mississippi. And they, 
they had organized the freedom because the you know the Mississippi um, politicians had claimed black people were happy and content and weren't interested in voting. So they organized the freedom vote in 63. And 63,000 people voted. And that, that was also to acquaint them, as later Stokely and, and did in Lowndes County, to acquaint them with the procedures. The, um, and out of those procedures, <coughs> they decided to form a political party and to challenge three of the white, of the white congressmen. So they, they nominated Mrs. Hamer and, Ms., and Mrs. Victoria Gray and Mrs. Annie Devine. And uh, the lawyers went and gathered evidence of, as to the extensive na nature of voter suppression in Mississippi. As, and, and, the, the, and, uh, and then that was a little contretemps for the movement because SNCC was working in the American DP were working with the, the National Lawyers Guild, and, that, and they were two leftists for, uh, of course, they got red baited. Um, two leftists for Allard Lowenstein and the NAACP, but I worked all, all the time with, with, uh, with Bill Kunstler and Arthur Kenoy. So um, when I came, I came back to organize to help organize the, the um, congressional support for the challenge. And the, the guy who was really most instrumental, who has also not gotten the recognition that he, that he deserved, was William Fitz Ryan from New York. It is, it, when the Congress can, reconvened in January, it is, it is he who put forward the, resol the resolution because Congress makes its own laws and, and therefore the three co white congressmen had to step aside while the, de while the resolution was being debated. After, when he raised it, then 50 or 60 other congressmen rose up to support, to support him. Uh, and then when the vote was eventually taken, the MFTP got if I remember correctly, 149 votes, the, which was not enough because you had to have a majority of the, four thir of, of the 435. But at least temporarily, um, we had demonstrated just how crooked the system is. Coming out of, coming out of uh, Atlantic City and then the January, cha failed January challenge, um, did that did that, at that point, would those experiences have altered your and reshaped your basic perspective or just confirmed it? I'm trying to, I wasn't in Atlantic City. I was somewhere else for some, was that back in Mississippi? I wasn't in Atlantic City. No, because they had left, come up in the buses. You better turn this off. I think it was chasing. Yeah. We're rolling. Well, I was going to, we were back after a short break just to get a drink for a moment. Um, I was going to ask uh, <laughs> your perspective on that question just before we stopped. Um, did the MFDP experiences alter, adjust, or largely confirm your perspective at the time? You know, I was, I was thinking about that. My strongest memory, not memory, the strongest impact the MFDP did for me was not quite about politics per se. It was sitting in Mrs. Hamer's room and understanding that with all of my education that there were people like Mrs. Hamer who could see the world with a clarity that was infinitely superior to mine. Right? That they had a wholesomeness is he going to make me cry again? Uh, um, that, you know, if you weren't in touch with it, that you, did, you, know, you, you just didn't realize that it existed. Um, and it's different. Like Malcolm was somebody that you could, there are two people that I would have you know, followed anywhere. And Malcolm was one. The other was my second mother, Catherine Dunham. Um, <clears throat> But 
it humbled you to realize that all of this book learning and whatever was secondary to a particular kind of acuity about what makes the world go around and what is important in the world, what's important in life. Uh, so I think that's the strongest impact, getting to know, you know, you know pe people like, I mean, Bob was in Mississippi before I got there and with Amzie Moore, and they tell me that he was taking people down to register and he got beaten up you know, severely, and went back and took off his T-shirt and washed it, and then put it back on and went back down to the courthouse. But he said he was washing the the shirt because he didn't want the blood to scare the people. And, um, I mean, there is a heroism that defies description. So uh, those are the things that, because um, Mississippi, we used to just call Mississippi the state when going in. And then that's actually one of the reasons that I went ahead and got married, because if uh, I wanted something out of life in case I got killed, I wanted to partake of, of life. I mean, she was... She was a cool woman, though. <laughs> she was super cool, but I, you know, I, I had the, been a bachelor for a long time, but I just was trying. It was kind of like preparing your will. You know. What year did you marry? Sixty. I think it was sixty-five. Yeah. Somebody you from the Mississippi context? No, 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 no. no I, but you come out of that. Uh, no. I mean, you'd, you'd had that experience. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, uh, and I, I went back to for after the after the after January. I went back to went back to the state for a while. I'm sorry, you went back after the after after January. I went back for a while. Uh, no, I, I I I married this very attractive young woman whom I met in New York. Turn it turn it off. <laughs> we're back. We're back. <laughs> um, February 21, 1965. We were in a, a, NSM was having a meeting in upstate New York, and all of our project directors and people were there when we heard that Malcolm had been killed. Um, you know, it was, first it was unbelievable, then you get pissed out of your mind. <laughs> the, uh, but he was in a, you know, every once in a while history will produce someone. Uh, in this Village Boys piece I wrote on the 20th anniversary of Malcolm's assassination, I was saying the, Martin kind of embodied the personality of the South, but, Martin, but Malcolm embodied the personality of the urban North black, black person. So they, they didn't just kill a man, they killed the prototype. Um, so we were all just, we came on back to the, to the city, you know, to find out what had happened and, and whatever. And then that day, you know, well later for the, for the funeral, you know, the, um, I was just thinking, now suppose where Wilkins had died, but these zillions of people, you know, be trying to go to, to his funeral. I didn't have anything against Roy Wilkins. It was just a different, it was just a, a different kind of image. So that was a, an irreplaceable loss. What were, um, what were your choices in front of you at that point with NSM and, and graduate school and all, and how did you move forward from early 65? I was just thinking about that. I got married, went back to, sc went back to school, 
Um, I was still doing, riding back and forth to New York. I had a job at Columbia for a while with uh, Gizmo's father. I'm sorry, what? I'm trying to think of it. Of, oh, we did, that's why Vincent called me again. And I went down, because w we put together this TV program called Black Heritage, which is on, on CBS. And many of the people whom he had, Vincent and John Henry Clark, um, in, in essence, it was you know the first representation of black studies, certainly on television. But CBS would put it on you know five o'clock in the morning. You know, TV in those days would go off at one or whatever. And then it would come back. With, I forgot what they used to call it to come back on at five or six, and then the very first thing on would be Black Heritage. And then years later, some students were trying to track it down, and, and I don't remember whether it was CBS or whether it was later HBO, because HBO did the trial of James Earl Ray and then denied that they had done it. So we did, and as I said, most of the people, the Boggses and Lerone, the people who were involved in in that Black Heritage series, Vincent um, invited to to Atlanta after Martin was assassinated, and and Coretta asked him to uh, to become director of the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Center. Yeah. Uh, when did uh, I think I had a mistaken sense of when uh, Black Heritage aired? It began airing. I have no approximately somewhere between I think sixty five or sixty six, maybe sixty seven. Okay, I was thinking sixty seven. Some yeah, somewhere it might it might even have been sixty eight. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Well, somewhere in that I think in that three year yeah. period. Yeah. Well, uh, are there? Uh, I'm sure there are many, but are there especially interesting things that you would want to say about the the shift of context now back to graduate school and. Um, you know, finding your academic life now engaging these same questions, but from that angle. Well, I had discovered an, another hero to study, Franz Fanon. So I was and La Guerre d'Algerie and the Algerian War. The uh, so plunging myself in, into the F, into the F, into the FLN the, um, and appreciating Fanon. So you discovered another hero. Was that was Fanon someone you met? I mean, came across. No. Well, Fanon e emerged in the in the movement because f many people who were opposed to Martin's. Uh, nonviolence would quote Fanon because F Fanon t talked about bearing colonialism in the bowels of the bowels of the earth, and so many people who who uh, never read like it Les Dames de la Terre never read Bastille of the Earth and, and didn't know squat about the Algerian War, but they would they would just take uh, an excerpt from Fanon and and use it to you know, to contravene Martin's notion of, of nonviolence. So th then I decided to read the book and then, mm -hmm. and then from there I decided, you know, I, I went on to try and understand the whole, you know, the whole, because then every other thing, a lot of kinds of other things open up. You know, the, you know, the, contribution, the contribution of French Africans in World War II. In the liberation of Paris, the Allies insisted that the black troops not march. They went and got anybody who didn't look black, Egyptians, whatever, uh, other Europeans, to march you know, down the Champs-Élysées and the Arc de Triomphe. I mean, the racism is incredible. Um, and you know, so that just opened up a whole different, broadened, broadened my perspective about what Malcolm 
was talking about how rewarding a, a subject of study hist history is, but she began to put things together. Because history is, t I tell my students, history is just, it's not about dates. You understand the significance of dates and events when you understand the continuity, how things are connected. Then you will rem remember, it's not different, but just to remember dates abstractly doesn't mean anything to you. How, what is the flow of history? How do we get from A to B to C to D? Hmm? Um, and once you begin to understand the flow, then things become remarkably clearer. And, it, and even, you, you may even remember them. <laughs> How did the graduate faculty at Harvard respond to the work you were doing as a, as a graduate student? Well, I was um, studied with Eric Erickson, and I, initially I was going to be a shrink because I loved I loved uh, Freud, and and they had and they had told me what was this class I was taking was boring. Edward Boring, he was a, a psychologist. Interesting guy, but the, um, we went to a mental hospital in Waltham, and there was a black guy there and at the time we were studying this English guy, non-directive therapy. So when you're involved with a relationship um, with a, in that dyadic relationship, the two of you, you're never supposed to you're never supposed to impose yourself. And so you know the typical technique is when they say something, you simply repeat it. So he asked he asked me, "Are you one too?" And I said, "Am I one?" And it turned out he was a World War I vet, and racism had driven him crazy. Um, and then the field changed. The field went from psychoanalysis to drug therapy. And, uh, and then when I discovered Fanon, I said, well, that's the, that's the psychology I'm interested in. <laughs> That's that liberation cycle. Yeah, liberation therapy. That's what I'm interested in, right? <laughs> so I made this, I made the switch from Freud to Fanon. Mm -hmm. In fact, years ago, the, not I brought Ma Madame Fanon here to, to speak before she died. Actually, she's alleged to have committed suicide, which I don't understand. Josie Fanon. Have you ever been to Algiers? Yeah. Paris? Jim Perry. Let's talk about um, the emergence after, um, well, actually, let me maybe stop and uh, ask you about um, the events of spring of 68 and uh, how they would, in their course in a year or so, lead to the notion of the IBW. And maybe maybe yeah. it should be a good point too to talk about um, uh, you know, kind of your long view of Dr. King. Well, as I said, my initial view of, of Martin, I met Martin a couple of times in the course of the movement, um, but he didn't make any particular. And and of course, I'd been at Selma, and when he turned us around, I, you were there. yeah, I was in Selma for the third march because there were three, yeah. and in fact, SCLC. Uh, you know, the original march was supposed to be for, to carry Jimmy Lee Jackson's body to Montgomery. But SCLC toned it, toned it down and made it a voting rights march. And so they called for us, and I, I came down with the NSM people. Um, but in fact, you, you, you will not be able to recognize me, but we, we were captured in one of the, in the Eyes episode, Bridge to Selma. You, you see our bus pulling into, into Selma and uh, NSM people and, and, and I are, are getting off the bus. But then after he turned us around and we found out that 
that a deal had been made, it, it did not enhance my, my view of Martin. Um, it's only later in Atlanta with Vincent listening, because Vincent was in Albany with, uh, with Martin, and he lived across, and Vincent also lived across the street from Gladys, no, Gladys Knight went to the church across the street from Vincent's house, and Bernice Reagan lived on the first floor of, of, of Vincent's house. But when Vincent started, when we you know, started researching, because we our, our initial um, project was to try and understand the movement that had just ended, the, when he started talking about Martin and his relationship to Martin, the things Martin had done, and the things that Martin had been subjected to. And then later, when I w started teaching on Martin and Malcolm, and read um, Carol's Bearing the Cross, I, <laughs> I gained a greater admiration for Martin, because Martin was converging toward Malcolm. There's a quote that I use in Make It Plain that he makes six months before his assassination, where he says that everything he has been doing so far has been in vain. The whole thing has to be done away with. And by the whole thing, he means the whole structure uh, of the American political economy. Dabba, 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 do. <laughs> um, so Martin, and that's so, and that's just, it's, it's the same disillusionment that leads to black power. It's the same disillusionment that most of the movement people, you know, just went through. I mean, when they, when Malcolm is attacked for being a hater and preaching violence, as I said, he was as hard on, on black people as he was on white people. But the critical question is not whether or not Malcolm was a hater. The critical question is why did tens of thousands and thousands more of black men and women be sympathetic to Elijah Muhammad's description of the white man as the devil? That's the question. The, but America can't face itself. It can't face evil in its history. Everything it does is supposedly, you know. So it talks about, again, to go back to the Lincoln example, oh yes, it was, there was slavery here. It was a little blip. It's a little blip, um, unfortunate blip in our history. But in 1860, America was the greatest slaveholding country in the history of the world, of the world. So if you, when, as I say, when you start recontextualizing things, you, you draw much different conclusions. So I, I began to, and after his death, and principally through Vincent and through the research we did at IBW, and subsequent research um, for my Malcolm and Martin course, I began to, to, to gain much more respect for Martin. I mean, if you just look here, one of the things that he and Malcolm had in common, they were always on the road. And, um, and Martin had this whole responsibility to raise money for SCLC. The, and then the jealousy the, um, that, he had to, that he had to contend with. So I, I began to appreciate him much more as a, as a, you know, a very, very significant, distinguished, important, Person. Tell me about Vincent Harding. Vincent. I met Vincent. At, we were at, I think, Miami of Ohio, for some kind of mini conference where we were on a panel together when we first met, and then we stayed in touch. And then he, you know, what, 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 when Black Heritage uh, came up, he and John Clark asked me to participate. In that, I'm sorry, who asked you? John Henry Clark oh, yeah, yeah. and 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 Vincent. Yeah. Um, so I participated in that, and then when he, when he told when he told me about the IBW uh, and asked me to come join him in Atlanta, you know, I I said yes, because the movement, the formal movement, had died, <clears throat> and. 
and there were all of these, yeah. you had um, all of the, these different things were going on, these different ideologies. You had Pan-Africanism, Bar Baraka, had, Baraka had, was leading Pan-Africanism before he switched to Marxism, and everybody was ch changing their name, <laughs> which I thought was ridiculous. In fact, there's, a, there's a, a very interesting debate between me and Stokely on, on this whole question of, of um, of the, his All African People's Revolutionary Party. I said, Tricky, we got this is our struggle here. Uh, and go organize your mama. <laughs> you know, you, you have to, you have to, to, to mobilize people and to inspire them. You must talk to them, as Mao Zedong said, you must talk to the people, and as I'm paraphrasing, in the language they understand. Um, so, IBW had been, there was a concert in, in Howard to, to which Walter Rodney came. And we had, and Bobby Hill, who is the Garvey Scholar at UCLA, Bobby and Walter, Walter they had been at, at um, Mona to the University of the West Indies, and then they had and they had gone. They had been together in '68 at a a, a a a black writers conference, I think, in Toronto, and then the Jamaican government, the JLP, did not allow Walter to return. So Walter was. Um, Went to went to Tanzania. Was teaching at the University of Dar es Salaam. Um, but be, and some, it's probably something before that because he did. He may have been in Guyana at some point. Because anyway, he came up. He came up. Yeah, seventy one or seventy two. He came back. Because he wouldn't, they wouldn't, he had gone, he'd gotten a job to, to, to teach at the, in Guyana, but they wouldn't, yeah. what, Forbes Brennan wouldn't let him. So what we, um, Emmanuel Wallerstein and, and James Turner, and I had, I'd, yeah, this was later then, the, we would get spe speaking engagements for him to, to, to help him raise, raise money. But Walter came to the, before that, Walter had come to, to the summer research symposium um, that we conducted at, at Atlanta, and we became great friends. So I went, I went to Africa to, in '71 or '72 to visit to visit him in in Dar, and that was also another eye-opening experience because you had, you know, Nereri was. Being like Nkrumah had been previously was being idolized in in in, in the black world, and you, just like there had been uh, these American bl ex black expats who had gone to Ghana, you had these bl black expats living living in Tanzania, and I just found them very f funny actually because they were living in this country but they hadn't learned the language, um, and then when I got off the plane and ran into them uh, and. It was, I, I just thought it was very revealing the questions they asked me. You know, how were the Green Bay Packers doing? Um, at Kettering, which was another important lesson that I learned, which was reinforced when I, after I went to Cuba. You may rail against this country. You may call it all kinds of names, but you have no idea how it has crept into your mind. How, what are you used to? You go in, it's dark in a room, and you turn on the lights. Well, what happens when you're somewhere where there is no electricity? Or you're going to take a shower, and, the, and you must, in your shower, and water being pumped from the sea. Or there are no, I was, well, going to visit my grandparents in Georgia, I was used to outhouses. So that wasn't, <laughs> that wasn't. But still, you, you, you gain more appreciation of 
the extent to which you may have disagreements with a particular society, but how it has affected you in ways that are beyond your kin, right? um, and that you then have to come to terms with. You then have you then have to come to terms with the degree to which you have been socialized by the forces that you are railing against. So uh, that was an important lesson for me in uh, in Dar. Tell me about the. Uh Tell me about the, the mood and the, and the project of IBW. It was a, it's an ambitious mission statement that emerges. Mm -hmm. Well, it was the Black Studies thing, so we had a major conference and we brought in the people who were uh, initiating Black Studies. As I should have mentioned in terms of MFTP, the person who was organizing um, out, of, out of Washington was Mike Thelwell, who was here, just retired from, from, from here. The wayward Jamaican, <laughs> the, the, um, but initially, as I said, it was. Well, there was a. There was a little tension because, the advisors of the King Center, wanted it to simply be, you know, Hallelujah Martin, um, and it, and they almost wanted us to take a, an oath of, of. Nonviolence, and we said, "No, later, baby, we ain't doing that." So, so, so then we split and became and became in, and, be, and became independent. And we had newsletters, so we were commenting uh, on, on on current events. We had students that we were teaching, um, some of whom we've been kicked out of for protesting out of Morehouse and elsewhere. And then we had a relationship with Wesleyan, so we had students from Wesleyan. Who came down to our to our symposium, some of research? Who came down to study with us? In fact, you're working with one, James Early. Early was one of my students, whom I just have disowned subsequently. <laughs> no, that's not true. We we stay. He calls me Papa, <laughs> <laughs> and then because we have also have a, a, a mutual uh, uh, tie to to, to 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 Cuba. Yeah. The, um, But then we just, you know, we got, I'm sure we, the office was broken into several times. I'm sure we were co-intelproed. Yeah. And, uh, and then, of course, the, the powers that be, you know, after we you know, separated from, the, as, as I said in the, in the piece, after we lost our Martin benediction, it was much more difficult to get foundation money. So we had to decide um, to try and be as independent as we could. Yeah. You know? So then, some of us who had who, who had degrees, um, Vincent left went went to his Quaker because Vincent's a, a Mennonite. Um, I guess that's one of the ties between him, religion is a tie between him and, and and Martin. So he went to Pendle Hill. Chester Davis, who had who had taught at Sir George Williams in Canada and who was our our education person, he came here, and here at the time at UMass, Thelwell was here. Whom I knew from SNCC, and Ivanhoe, whom I knew from SNCC, and there was a guy whom I didn't know, Sharif Gilal, who had been, who was with the FLN, and he used to teach the Fanon course. So Ivanhoe and Gilal, I hope I'm pronouncing his name, when they left, they asked me to come uh, and take their places. And so that was, that's what I did, and, back, and in those days it was. You know, it was no big thing because you could fly from New York to Atlanta for ninety bucks. So we we all computed back and commuted back and I say computed, commuted, commuted back and forth for many years. And then um, Howard Dodson, who had been in one of our, had come in with Andrew Billingsley and from California, and George. What is George? George became police commissioner of Atlanta. Um, but he had been a student of Billingsley's. Howard, Howard then, Howard then became director of IBW, and then after Howard, we had two Jan Douglas and Pat Daly, essentially, who ran IBW. So IBW lasted till 1983. Yeah, uh, I heard that. Um, <coughs> well, and we talked about this before we started today. There's a new book about IBW by um, Derek White. Mm -hmm. 
and in a piece that he did last year that I still haven't seen the book yet, then the piece that he wrote a year ago, kind of on the IBW, Journal of African American History, or studies, I think. Um, he said that he described you in, in kind of the tally of the faculty and staff who emerged at the early IBW, that you, that, that you were a disciple of Malcolm the Black and a political nationalist in that context. And uh, I wonder if that is, is the way that you would have made the description and what you, whatever your answer to that is, what, how you would have described your, your kind of political philosophy and perspective. Well, I've never um, thought about how to describe myself politically, actually. I think Manning Marable wrote a piece once in which he described James Turner and me as left nationalists. Mm -hmm. um, but I, if I were to pick one, I would say, you know, if I'm anything, I'm a Malcolmite, and I'm the, I'm, Malcolm is the, is the fundamental guiding political influence of... Uh, in, in my life, yeah. Okay. I have to say, as I said, I just got Derek's book. I have to see how he uh, tells the story. Although I, I read his, his dissertation, and, and what I read seemed to me of the, of the treatment so far, I think he's done the best job. Because yeah. it's hard to describe. I mean, IBW was the first and the only independent black think tank in this country's history. The, um, and trying to, I mean, there's a, f one of the most important elements of struggle is who defines. Yeah. The, um, I mean, there's a, there's a, an African fable, they tell me that, that, uh, that one day the little elephant comes home from school and, and, and asks his mother, he says, mother, in, in school, the lions say they are the king of the jungle, I, and I thought we were the king of the jungle. And his mother tells him, well, they will always teach that in your school until we run the school. So there's a dialectic there. And the history, Negro history begins first trying to excavate you know, black people's contributions to the land to try and advance the case, please treat us uh, as equals. But then uh, Black Studies comes along. When you begin to dig up the, s the suppressed lacunae, you begin to get a whole different hi history of America. And then you begin to get, um, when, you know, when people t talk about Malcolm as a critique, you have to put, in my judgment, you have to put Malcolm with Jimmy Baldwin. Because uh, the fire next time, Jimmy lays America down on the couch <laughs> and, and analyzes it. Uh, and he analyzes the, the psychology of racism. The, um, the black people, you know, uh, he says, suppose you have a bucket, and the black people have a bucket. And then America stands on this bucket, and when you pull the bucket out from under their feet, they go topsy-turvy. So you must keep this hierarchy as fundamental to the maintenance of, of America's identity. So Jimmy must, in my judgment, you know, along with Malcolm, is the two sharpest you know, cr critics of the contradictions of American society in, the, in, in their time period. Did you, uh, on your, um, uh, we, we've certainly touched on it and are right now, but I, I still feel in some way that we haven't quite um, done what we might, and I think it'd be very valuable in this series to have you say a little bit more about the, the full nature of the critique as you were hinting, and not hinting, but you know, describing it in, in, in summary form. Are there more things that you would like to say? Well, what you understand, to, to go back to your earlier point, I mean, Vincent was a tremendous influence. I mean, Vincent does, um, he does, there is a river, that history up to, through the, the Civil War, 
there is and given his it's a, uh, there is a river the streams of which make glad the people of God and then we were we had a we thought we had a contract with with a DC television station WETA all right to do something like black heritage and so we put together the a, a, hit, a history because it was supposed to be yes it was supposed to be for uh, the centennial 1976 I think um, but then the station got bought us anyway oh no roots came and they said well one black thing is enough so they had they did so roots roots took our uh, was 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 the black um, historical television story f for the for the year so Benson took what we had done, and he published it as the other American Revolution. The, um, and then later, he's done a book. He's done t uh, Hope in History: How to Teach the, the History of the Movement, you know, to high school young people. And then he's done Martin, um, the Inconvenient Hero, because as I again tell the students, what do you, all they know about Martin is the March on Washington, and I have a dream. But the, but the next five years of Martin's life go down Orwell's memory hole. And that's what Vincent does. Vincent explains that the whole history of, of, of Martin, and especially those last five years, Martin's, Martin's development and his evolution. So Vincent was a tremendous influence on me, at least, and I think on everybody. As I, uh, he and Lerone helped me think about how to write better. And... As I also said, he has the gift of communication. As I said earlier, you know, your mother could be dead, and but by the time Benson explains it to you, you'd be saying, "Oh, Ma's gone." It's happened. <laughs> the mellifluous one, I call it. <laughs> <laughs> he just turned eighty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but he's still out here. He and Grace Boggs, who's ninety-five going around the country trying to form alliances between seniors and, and young people, mm -hmm. in addition to the Oral History Project at, at, uh, at Islet that he's been, been directing for the last decade, decade, decade and a half probably. We haven't, um, we haven't done but bump against it, but I'd be really interested to have you uh, reflect a little bit about uh, Cone Pelpro and the whole effort by the state to smash domestic dissent? Well, we always said the man was everywhere. Um, but, you know, we, we thought FBI, CIA, we didn't know. After Malcolm, we found out the MI5 and the Surrett and the Mossad and everybody was tracking Mal Malcolm. The, um, and Martin, too. And, and the State Department, everybody, you know. The Malcolm seemed to be too much of a, a danger to too many to too many people. So you always assume. I mean, you, your experience was you'd seen the FBI doing nothing and or virtually colluding with the with the forces of evil. Um, so you had no res and Hoover. You know, you had no respect for for them. And then you have the other question, not just COINTELPRO. You have the question of the behavior of of the of the, of the police. Mm -hmm. The police are the, are the military arm of the racist state. And every rebellion, when, I began, when, we, when we began talking about 63, every rebellion in this country, with the exception of May 63 in Birmingham uh, and, the, and the zillion that occurred I think 200 after Martin's assassination, every rebellion, not a race riot, every rebellion was in response to some police act of racism, either actual or, or, or perceived. People thought they'd done something, and so they blow up. Um, because of the context, obviously. Mm. History and context. So, you ha and that's why this whole history of, of urban rebellions. Because race riots, it, it, it has the connotation like of 
two forces and and also mindlessness you know, the rioting this is no reason there's no political reason there's no justification for that people are just rioting but but I happened to have been in, I was in Harlem in 64, and I was in Detroit in 67. And the rebellions in, 60, in Detroit were quite purposeful. The, the Lebanese who called themselves Chaldeans were exploiting, the, they purposely, uh, their stores were, were targeted. And not only were they targeted, requests were made. People were, were they, do you want a TV? Do you want it? Sent. They would provide people. People put in the order. <laughs> they would get. They would. They would get whatever the merchandise was. And then after they had satisfied all of the all of the community demands, then they would. Then they would. Uh, you know, crack crack the crack the store. But I also was the Newark Black Power Conference, which was held after after Newark, were once again. The residents were targeted particular stores, but then the National Guard came in and perceived what was going on, and so they smashed everything to convey this notion of mindlessness. And the same thing in Detroit, the media would report, why are they burning down their homes? They want people not burning down their homes. It's because, it's because the wind, the, the fire department would not, would not come down in, into the areas the wind blew the damn flames over there. But this, no, this necessity, because if rebellion is legitimate, then America is illegitimate. And so therefore you must always define the behavior as illegitimate. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the kind of things that, that, uh, that IBW, and looking at what was going on, and how America interprets events, that crystallize your, your concept of of, of an analysis of the nation. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Pause for just a second. As they say, we're back. We're back on that track. Set them off. Bill, let me ask about um, the project that culminated, I think, '94 with publication of Make It Plain, the book on, on Malcolm. And um, I'm interested in your reflections on that. Of course, was, was a companion to a to a, a documentary that was televised, and um, I'm interested in your perspective on interpreting Malcolm in that kind of context uh, for what will be a national and popular audience in some way. Well, Make It Plain arises out of um, an Eyes on the Prize episode. The ep episode was called The Time Has Come. It was a half hour, it was one and then it goes on to the to Stokely and the Meredith Meredith March, but um, Blackside, Henry Hampton's organization, which, who must be given great because he got Blacks this Eyes on the Prize funded during the Reagan era. The um, that episode got more response than any other episode in the Eyes series. And so Blackside would then enter into a, uh, a relationship with PBS to do, to do, make, it, to do make It Plain. And they, they, since I had been a, a, a consultant for the Eyes episode, they asked me to consult on the, and I, and in essence, to be immodest, they asked me to be chief consultant. Um, and so I did. I agreed to do that, and then they asked, they wanted a companion book, and they asked a much more well-known writer than I um, to, and he presented a proposal and I saw it and thought it was lacking. And so I critiqued it and suggested how the, the book, sh sh the introduction of the book should go. And they said, well, write it. <laughs> and I said, okay. Because at the time, you know, there was this great hullabaloo around Malcolm. The rap people, public enemy was talking. Every autobiography was in every, in every bookstore. 
And I thought that people really didn't appreciate. I wanted to try and describe why, as, as objectively as I could, why I thought Malcolm was a great man. And that's how I tried to write, to write Make It Plain. Was that on the heart? No, I'll just pause for a second. We'll be back after a short break. Um, let, let's take just a minute here, and um, since we've just talked about uh, Make It Plain, and um, you obviously are, right now, are, are just um, publishing a, a piece on in, in response to uh, the new Manny Marable Malcolm X biography, and in, in brief, can you summarize the the, the critique of Marable's book that you present there? Well, essentially, the crit the critique is that the uh, the book is full of historical omissions and historical gaps, and un and unverified speculation. And, and the reinvention trope. Well, reinvention. It, Reinvention places the agency in the hands of the interpreter, and what I and what I attempted to show in the article is that that methodology could be applied to, to anyone, uh, and could be applied nefariously if one was so in, was so inclined. Um, but I mean, my, my the the tr the trashing of Everyone that Manning does, Betty Shabazz and Alex Haley, in, adi in addition to Malcolm, and the, and the self-righteousness with which he puts himself forward as someone now who's going to, to, to give the world a real story. And there is, in fact, hardly nothing that's really new, the, 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 the assassins were identified in 1992 and 93. In fact, earlier, when uh, Talmadge Hare, with Bill Kunstler, had was had was fighting for a new trial, he identified the other four people, and it was and that information was written, published in Zach Condo's book *Conspiracies*, and was also published in m most of it was published in Carl Evans's book. Uh, book, the, the Judas Factor, who killed Ma Malcolm X, and there's lots of attribution. Um, there are lots of borrowings from other people in in Manning's book that are not attributed. Mm -hmm. He bo he borrows heavily from Evans, Evans's book on the Messenger, Evans's book. On, he, he borrows heavily from Make It Plain. Uh, it is just truly unfortunate he is not here to explain himself. Yeah. Yeah. Let me shift back to um, something that we wanted to cover and, and uh, skipped over. Um, the not small question of SDS. And yeah, I had... The SDS had, you know, very, had good relations with the original, NS, original NSM and I'm met them. We had a joint conference in Ann Arbor at some point, and 60, I think later 63 in Ann Arbor. The, and then SDS went into community organizing as well. Junius was in Newark. And we said, what are you guys doing? Trying to copy our shit. <laughs> And then they did ERAP too. I mean, they tried, you know, they tried, Stanley Arano was one of the major ideologues. They were trying to organize on, a, on an economic basis, and, and they were, uh, and then they were trying to do community organizing, the most famous of which, you know, was in, in, in Newark. But we came to a, a little parting of the, of the ways because the first racial division of labor in the movement as far as I can tell, was what we did in NSM years before uh, SNCC. In fact, there's a famous, there's a, there's a famous, not famous, it was famous to me, um, when SDS people and 
and Cortland of SNCC were telling me that what NSM had done was not appropriate because we were all supposed to be one big happy family. But what I had discovered going up to Harlem one day, one evening, that uh, the, the white girls were there with, with the dudes and they were sitting down on um, these mattresses in the, in the basement like on 157th Street. And, the, um, and they were drinking wine and singing wobbly songs. And then, they would t and then they would take them down to, to Peter Buttonweiser's house. You look up Buttonweiser. He was a major force in terms of America's involvement in Vietnam. He also was a, a, a zillionaire. But they were exposing them to a life they could never have. They were, they were exposing. And then you couldn't do anything with them after. You know. So what we did, NSM remained interracial. I just said no more white girls organizing in the ghetto. So we still had wh white males working. Frank Joyce was the director of the Detroit Project. Sam Lake and, and folk worked with me and others. We still, there was still an interracial presence in NSM. I just said no more white girls in the ghetto. And that was in 64, I think. Um, then SNCC had an Atlanta, then, you know, the, um, it's a whole, it's a problem about consciousness. Why do white people come, I mean, to join the struggle? And what's their idea of struggle? The, many of them remain American nationalists at heart. The, um, and they want to, you know, end poverty. They want to end, end the symptoms. The, um, and then some, you know, uh, for example, when I was in Mississippi, we were going to register, take people to register to vote. And this white girl wanted to hold my hand, you know, uh, to, as a demonstration of, you know, of, you know, we will, shall overcome or togetherness or we're going to over def defeat these crackers. I said, I can't tell you what I said. I <laughs> But what I ended up saying is, are you crazy? Because white people don't understand what other white people are capable of. Um, so she's going to hold my hand as a, as a, as a symbol of, you know, we're going to defeat these people. Not realizing she, get us both, she could get us both killed. Uh, so it's that, how do you people become acquainted with the J. Edgar Hoover's of the world and the Klan of the, of the world. They just have no idea about what this country, what some Americans are capable of. And it's a just, so I, I just said, no more white girls in the ghetto. And uh, in fact, I wrote it, it's in Charlie Cobb's book. Because um, I've been pilloried, racist dog, <laughs> and whatever. I said, no, no, this, this is, this was the reality of, for, you know, let us suppose, what was the, you know, this whole notion of, we must love one another. And I said, it's the Cold War and we are facing potential, the destruction of humankind and we are against nuclear weapons. So we are marching against the bomb. Are you asking the person who is marching with you against the bomb to love you? It's necessary. Why must they love you? See? Uh, why must you appreciate? Why must we kiss banana kiss your foot because you have come to help us in our struggle? Right? Um, so you you had to separate the wheat from the chaff in terms of white of white supporters. You know? Who was real? Who may people who may. They may have meant well, but they didn't, or as, uh, as uh, Bevel once said, you know, we had high hopes, 
but we didn't know what we were up against. Yeah. Harding's made that point too, I guess. Yeah. No, Vince is a minute that. He loves everybody. <laughs> but, yeah. Let me ask a, a final thought from my end. Um, <clears throat> how'd you read the Obama election? I thought it was a, a, a potential turning point for America. Um, I didn't get you know, ecstatic about it because the same percentage of white people who, who, who voted for, for McCain had voted for Bush in, two, in 2004. And the only reason Obama won is black people turned out in Virginia and, I think, and Florida and North Carolina 90, 98%, 99%. So he could win the electoral win the elector, the, elect, the elector, electoral vote, but it did appear. I mean, uh, f friends of mine in in, uh, in Spain and, f and in Europe, everybody thought this because remember he appeared to be the quint quintessential anti-Bush, and the world hated Bush. Um, Donald Duck maybe could have won <laughs> had he won. So. It seemed like maybe it was, a t and then what he, had, you know, in his campaign, the things he was saying, it looked like it looked like you know, the possibility of real change. Let me bring back to um, final thought, and, and uh, uh, you mentioned you talked earlier about media and and the construction of culture and the construction of what passes as history and consciousness and all and. Um, just interested a little bit in if you could talk a little bit about your perspective on what you regard as really well considered a really well considered black studies curriculum. Well, it's what I think now is not what I thought, uh -huh. <laughs> not what I thought before, precisely because of the changes that have occurred. The um, black studies, per se, to paraphrase Stokely, is necessary, but it is no longer sufficient. We are on a, we are all on a ship called America, and if the ship goes down, whether we are first class working with the cabin with the captain or in steerage, we all go down together. And America is going on its way to hell. The, um, we are the greatest debtor nation in the history of the world. The, uh, the people who are supposed to, Obama et al., who are supposed to confront the problem cannot confront the problem because they won't admit what the real problem is. You paid more taxes than General Electric and Bank of America. Corporations pay 6.6% of the federal budget. You know? uh, the masses pay out of income tax and payroll taxes contribute 84%. And now they're laying off the public sector. So the revenues will, de will, de will decrease. We have a $15 trillion debt. We pay a trillion dollars an interest on the debt, which is never discussed. So what do they do with all this discussion yesterday and today about Geithner and the G20. All the, the Fed is like a monopoly game. Print money, print money, print money, print money, but it cannot last. And so what do you, the people who under, understand that it cannot last, what happens when the dollar is no longer the international reserve currency? What happens? It, this cannot last unless, and the jobs, are not coming back. The eight, the three million jobs are not coming back when you subsidize corporations to export jobs. The system is so corrupt. Uh, you have a little group called ALEC that, uh, that meets with the corporation and politicians. They've written 800 laws. There's nobody in Congress writing laws for the public interest. Um, and so when you ask about black studies, we are now in a different era because America was built upon the exploitation of the confiscation of Indian land and the exploitation of black labor until the industrial 
society. So immigrants, white immigrants could come and they could get these jobs. But now, they exploit you too. Yo, okay. We're yeah. Out. So, I mean, this is the problem. There's no real discussion of the real problems, and therefore, there's no real solutions that are being put forward. Just print more money, or because the same people uh, have the same perspective globally as here in America, the only solution they have is auster so called austerity. That means screw the public sector, but that cannot work. Uh, all, so we have, you know, white family income. Black people are disposable. We are now irrelevant. And increasingly large in numbers of white people are now economically irrelevant. And they don't care about education. The Re Reagans, when Reagan came to office, they wanted to get rid of the Department of Education. All they care about is privatizing education, as they privatize prisons, as they want to privatize Social Security, as they want to privatize every. Bush privatized 25% of the IRS, which people don't know. So when the, I, I had a grad student, and they audited her. She made $22,000. They audited her. They don't audit, but as Buffett said, they don't audit Buffett. And they didn't audit. We now find out the SEC destroyed 9,000 documents of investigation. And we now found out, find out that the general counsel of the SEC, SEC had $2 million invested in Madoff. Corruption with a capital K. So how do we, and what have they done? We ask about Obama. Obama's irrelevant because they, they have infiltrated all of the agencies. The foxes are in the hen house, in the SEC, in the NLRB, in the FAA. You, have, you flew here in a plane 35 years old, monitored by an air traffic control system also 35 years old. And they privatized the subcontractors to take care of the planes. No. Everywhere you look, um, there is corruption and, and money uber alles. But these people are different historically because one can make a case that slavery is logical, that one can make a case that feudalism is, logic, is, is logical. But these forces, they have let loose forces that they cannot control and they don't care. They don't care about the ozone depletion. So what, and, and, and you have a clown like Rick Perry who doesn't believe in climate change while 78% of his state is on fire and in, under drought and cows, and cows are dying. These people are mad. We are in the hands of idiots and maniacs and racist corruption. And I ask, I do not understand why there's not a revolution in this country. Um, but there is no opposition that will explain to people what are the problems and what must be done. That's why, as I say about, about black people, just because our cause is just like the Indians does not mean we will triumph. No. No. And America is going steadily. No. People all around the world, America has lost its credibility. We're on the wrong side of every question. Um, it's unbelievable. But of the American people, what are they, they're watching reality television and Fox News and Shrek 2. <laughs> it's Shrek 5 now. <laughs> it's a Shrek 5 now, right? Yeah. 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 We're back on, and, and during a quick break, um, Bill, we wanted to ask you just to stretch out and, and say a little bit more about the... the <coughs> rationale and, the, and the, the, the argument that led you to move white women out of the project of urban organizing? Well, there was a, the singing of the Wobbly songs, that was their legacy. That was their notion of, of politics. But you cannot, um, but you don't drink wine with people whom you're organizing. It's just like you don't have relations, sexual relations with people whom you organize. Although there were some people who believed, <laughs> who believed that you had to make out with everybody, ugly, ugly women as well as good looking women. So you, across the, uh, not in our thing, but a SNCC person, a, 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 a SALC person whom I will, 
Who am I? Well, it was Bevel, actually, <laughs> whose who's, uh, predilections have, you know, were exposed on for, at, the, at the end of his life. Terrible revelations about, about Bevel. So, it, it, and taking them down to the east side, and then you have to go back to Harlem. Oh, they took, they took the people they were organizing back to their homes on the east Down side. to the meet people like, go look up after this who yeah. Peter Buttonweasel was. Yeah. Buttonweasel. See, they're, they're exposing them to something that's had nothing to do with struggle. Huh? Well, that's kind of like the, the Tom Wolfe, Tom Nama of radical sheep, where the, where the Black Panthers were taken to all the east side parties in mm -hmm. New York and to raise funds, but it was again. A similar kind of tension. Yeah. Well, I have a, I had a problem with the in fact uh, with with the Panthers. Uh, because actually, it was the white left and the European left that is lionized, lionized the Panthers. The, um, which is not to say some of them, but I had guys who, because as we said before about the relationship between the black community and the police. To confront the police, to try and organize against the police, is quite logical and, and and was and was important. But they got friends of mine who were in the Jersey City Panthers. They got killed. Cops just were, like to kill Fred Hampton and Mark Clark. So, so that if you're going to speaking as an ex-marine, if you're going to take on the enemy, understand what you're doing. You don't announce, "Hello, I'm going to be out at 4:30, right?" That that the parading with parading and we're going, we're going to get you or we're going to pretend to get you. I mean, if you, so people then, it's like people do, do not understand what real, what a real confrontation with the police would entail. As I said, I was in Detroit. If I had had my platoon in Detroit, we could have taken over the city because the cops were shooting each other. They didn't know what they were doing. Um, an organized group. We could have taken over the city. We couldn't have held it, but we could have taken it for a day, for a day, day and a half. Um, but the um, just, just like you know, there is no theory of change in America because America is the best of all possible worlds. Right? All we have are blips that we can correct a little. A little blip here, a little blip, blip there, but there's no concept that the whole, as Martin said, that the whole thing must be done away with. So we have yet to have. I mean, people may talk about Marxism and talk about this and that, but we've yet to develop, and, and that's something that Malcolm was was working on, something that Boggs was laying out. But Malcolm was working on how do you really affect change in this country, and he put forward, as I wrote it in the article, he put forward two things: inter in, na nationally and internationally. Ballad of the Bullet was the national strategy, but hooking up with the, and exposing through the UN and, and elsewhere, hooking up with, with uh, international struggles. He was invited. He was invited to Algeria in March of 65. He, he had been, a, he and, um, and Che, Ben Bella had invited them both to a conference in, in, in Algiers, so he was conveniently killed two weeks, two, two and a half weeks before leaving for Algeria. Hmm. Bill, it's been, a, um, it's been a real privilege and an honor, and thank you for such a thoughtful um, and extensive commitment. Are there any final thoughts or? I'll think of a thousand things yeah, later. <laughs> People I left out, people I should have mentioned. Sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah, well, thank you. Oh, no, it's thank you. It's been a great privilege. Because uh, people have been asking me you know, to do a memoir. And, yeah. and um, one of the things that I've been lucky enough to meet some great, great people um, and being able to explain from my limited viewpoint the significance of those people, as I try to do with Malcolm, is what may make me sit down and, and write this memoir. Call once upon a time. Thank you. Thank you.
This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture.